Well, well, well. Welcome to the shop. And today, a welcome change of pace. Something that you probably don't see much on YouTube. But this is my little shop here. Just wanted to show that. Oh yeah, I got a, I got a masterpiece on the, downloading right now. If we speak. In this episode, we get to work on and check out. We'll talk about briefly something that's um made in the mid 60s 1966 is i think is when these things came out or were used mostly and it's just been the most stupendous thing you've ever seen completely different than anything you've seen on my channel and probably a lot of other people's channels and i just don't remember seeing one of these on youtube so let me buckle you in ladies and gentlemen this is a Motorola T1200 DC remote control. What is a DC remote controlled? Well, this is for two-way radio communications. And this would use a pair of uh, phone lines to connect to a base station transmitter located on, on a tower somewhere. Uh, this thing would use DC voltage with a audio superimposed on top of it to send audio to a transmitter, a remote transmitter and use that to communicate with. Uh, really neat little device. Again this is the T1200. <sighs> I bought this several weeks ago I got uh, several other Motorola things in here, but this is a uh, this is something I've been looking for. It's kind of rough. Sitting in a building for a long time, not being well taken care of, but um, of course that's a loudspeaker, front bezel pilot light and uh, let's see should be a volume control down there alright so come up here to the top here's your power transformer this is your output transformer right here from your audio amp this is right here this is a 6 AQ5 and I have tested it already and it is dead Oh boy, here is a 12AX7, everybody. Man, even this tube doesn't check good. But boy, I bet I could get $300 for it. You know how much 12AX7s cost nowadays, how ridiculous the price they are. But anyway, I digress. This is the line transformer. Remember I told you this uses telephone lines. It's actually a special telephone line. It's not one that you get dial tone off of. It's actually a pair of wire, what they call it, a pair of wire that is uh, directly linked to wherever this thing, other end of this thing to the transmitter uh, so uh, you can't get those anymore that is a thing of the past however this is the transformer that uh, that couples all this uh, the uh, voltage in this thing that generate the current and also the audio uh, this right here is the TR relay this is a telephone type relay. How about that big sucker? If I remember right, I don't remember what the coil voltage is on this. I was thinking it was 6 volts, but I, no, I don't think it's 6 volts. It might be 120. I do not remember. But this is what, when you have a microphone plugged into it, it's a big old desk type, desktop microphone. When you push the key button on the microphone, this relay will pull in. And when that relay pulls in, it, it couples uh, 140 volts through this uh, relay into this coil and comes out contacts, uh, these two contacts right here. And that goes out to the phone line and goes through all the telephone stuff that it has to get through to get to the other side to the base station transmitter. 
and then you have a similar arrangement with the transformer at the base station that takes the audio and the DC and separates the audio from the DC and the DC is used to pull yet another relay that's identical to this pulls it in and allows the base station to transmit so it's pretty pretty cool little setup this is uh, like I say they don't use DC to control transmitters anymore they use tone now uh, there's still tone remote control systems out there uh, that's a different story but this thing is pretty rough this is my little old project this is pretty rough here it, as you can see it's got a little bit of little bit of corrosion there a little bit there a little bit there but look at this PC board the PC board is uh, pretty rough I mean it's not bad 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 like some PC boards are but it's bad enough as you can see a lot of corrosion in this transistor right here pretty bad so oh and here's the selenium rectifiers right here this is a bridge network um, you got the plus slide here then you got a center contacts in here and then ground over here so it's like uh, you know what a four-way bridge is that's what these guys are these are seleniums if they continue to work I'm going to leave them alone now I've already checked this thing a little bit uh, when I first got it and I've already determined that these capacitors are bad this thing uses a lot of capacitors because it has to do a lot there is the voltages 50 at 350 40 at 350 30 at 350 10 at 350 this one here I think it should be where are you a 50 40 30 and 10 all at 350 and there's that beautiful heater again and I don't know what the value of this one is but they're all bad and I checked it uh, I put it on the bench feeder and we can do it again here I just have to make sure that uh, it'd be a good re way to show you how this uh, my variable IC supply and my dim bulb tester works so I may hook this thing back up and let's see so but this thing is uh, I have a use for this believe it or not people are like what in the devil are you going to do with this thing well I have an application that I could do this with as you may or may not surmise if you watched enough of my videos to pay attention in the background there's a radio that you always hear some kind of radio traffic on and that is the railroad I listen to the railroad a lot and uh, in my office I have a radio uh, that scans and um, I listen to the railroad however the railroad that I listen to uses a split frequency it uses a they call a dispatch frequency which is on one channel and then a train to dispatch which is on another channel however I use delay in my radio delay scan so it, it holds up for about a second and a half before it resumes scanning well, by that time I miss half the conversation or a lot of the conversation that the train crew is trying to say back to the dispatcher and vice versa depending on where it was last so what I'm going to do is I my, my work I have a tall tower that uses uh, antennas and networks in about the same frequency that these railroad radios use so I'm going to hook a receive only radio to my antenna there at work and have a pair of uh, a wire a, a wire pair going from here this device into my well into another remote device that this can hook to uh, that's going to take the audio from the radio, inject it into the phone line, send it to this in my office, and I'll be able to use this to uh, listen to the train to dispatch channel. So uh, it's something to do, something to keep me occupied. I've always, I mean, I used to work on a lot of these old things. They were actually pretty old when I worked for Motorola back in the 80s. So they were 20 years old when I got into radio. But I believe this thing is uh, capable of running again. I can pretty sure all these caps is going to have to be changed. Uh, well, like I said, these two are bad. 
they're weak they're no they're not any good I tested the output transformer right here I tested all the windings on it it seems to be good so that's good we're not I'm not worried about that power transformer check good and this uh, transformer here should be good I've never seen one of these fail TR relay apparently works now the only thing that I've got to do is clean all this mess up change a bunch of these caps these resistors are probably bad because I'm pretty sure there's been some little Mises using the using their bathroom in here just like that that there that transistor needs to be replaced I've got the part number four and it should be a fairly easy job to find a transistor to change that with I probably have some if I dig around anyway it's gonna be a fun little project and uh, so let me uh, let me pause you for a minute and let's look underneath all right, here's underneath the radio. Got a little issue here that looks like somebody. This is I don't think it's supposed to be like that. Uh, but I'll straighten that out. I do it very carefully. I don't want to break that phenolic. Uh, this is the underneath of the rig. Again, there's that terminal strip right there. Uh, let's see here. These are all the adjustment controls for various things compression and receive and transmit levels Here's the bottom side of that big relay that you saw now those little circuit board here with yet another cap bunch of uh, Allen Bradley style resistors. No big deal 0.47 micro fair 400 volt uh, capacitor right here and another one here uh, I think that's a 2 micro fair. I don't remember what the voltage is. I can't see it that's the bottom of that line transformer right there uh, let's see what else we have here's the circuit board for the uh, amplifier section uh, what I'm going to probably do is pull this board out uh, which means I've got to take a bunch of pictures and make a lot of notes and note and mark all this stuff where it comes from and I'm just going to pull this board out and give it a good cleaning and then I'm going to clean the chassis too and then once I get all that done uh, what I'll do next is I'll change all these filter caps and I'm just going to leave the cans in there uh, but what I'll probably do and I'm going to probably uh, go I've got plenty of room on this thing I'll go probably up here on this side here and mount some terminal strips and uh, I'll just uh, when I uh, I'll cut these connections loose right here I'll just uh, and put some uh, spacers on here some isolated spacers or isolated terminals I'll just solder them to these terminals that you know on the cap itself and just extend the wiring out and come over here and uh, connect to my terminal strip and I'm not going to restuff these caps I'll leave them alone because this this is not something that's a collector's item I'm going to tell you that right now uh, and uh, I've already pulled this cap loose. This cap here is completely shorted. I mean, there's none of that so-called cap reforming crap going on here. These things are way past that. And if you look real close, really close, let me get you a light. Oh, sorry about that. Let's see if we can get a little bit of light on there. Can y'all see? Right there. That's all the guts of that capacitor coming out. Let's see if we can get a little bit better light now. Yeah. See that little black blob right there? Of course you can't. See how people do this stuff one-handed. Yeah, if you can see it right it's hard to see right there a little black blob that is the guts coming out of that capacitor and that one is the same way the guts is coming out of it matter of fact you can't see here but the bottom is bulged then this capacitor here I don't see nothing coming out of it but it's getting changed too so anyway uh, you got various other components another capacitor here uh, another control here, which I think is a compression point, but I don't remember. I had to get the manual. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, of course you got your speaker. 
right there, which is self-explanatory. Your speaker, your volume control, and your, uh, I believe this is the transmit light. So when you hit transmit, this light will come on and it'll light this little indicator on the front. Um, anyway, it's a cool little gadget. It'll be a worthwhile little project to get into. Um, and it says use genuine, where's my corner? Use genuine Motorola replacement parts. Well, I would love to, but they don't make genuine Motorola parts for this thing anymore. They probably hadn't made it in probably 30 years or more. So, all right, so that's that. Um, what I think I'll do is we'll get the schematic out and we'll just kind of take a look at that schematic and uh, see what's going on with this thing. It's relatively simple. It's just a little audio amp that, uh, basically an audio amp with a microphone that uh, applies that audio to a line driver transformer and sends about 90 volts DC down a phone line and uh, about 40 milliamps I think. No, I'm sorry, 12 and a half milliamps. 12 and a half milliamps. And it uses that 12 and a half milliamps uh, to tell it you want to transmit. And you can do other things with this here that uh, this one doesn't do that you can tell it to, uh, you know, if it's a private line system, which is a coded squelch system, which all that means is like a CB is a carrier squelch type thing. But a lot of commercial two-way radios use a coded squelch type thing, which means it's not only is that a signal has to be there, it has to be a certain subaudible tone, and everybody was assigned a certain tone. Say like in say like in the country, you know, if you were the farmer in the country and there's really holding out a lot of people around, you could probably just use carrier squelch, uh, which meant it worked like a CB. However, if you're in a mini, uh, city like California, somewhere in California or New York or some, you know, it's got a lot of radios in it. Well, there's so many frequencies in use that people have to share. And uh, so what they've done is, is uh, if you got tractor with ABC uh, farm in one spot and then you got uh, uh, GHI plumbing somewhere else in town and they're on the same frequency, you don't want the two hearing each other. So the Motorola come up with a coded squelch system which uses a subaudible tone to unlock the receiver. In other words, uh, nobody could hear the other. Uh, and uh, it's called private line. And anyway, uh, the rule book says, the FCC says, if you're going to use this kind of system, you have to monitor the channel before you transmit. So you don't want to just start talking up the radio and talking on it. Somebody might be on there, you just don't hear. So these remotes employed a monitor switch. And a monitor switch sent a two and a half mil current down the line, which told the receiving a negative two and a half mil current as compared to 12 and a half mils positive. So it used that minus two and a half to tell the, uh, to tell the base station, I need you to monitor channel so what it would do is it would uh, place the receiver in. it would take it out of uh, tone squelch mode and put in carrier squelch mode and then you could hear if there was anybody on the channel before you transmit it uh, then if you had a multi freak then it did do different uh, certain other things it would send different voltages on there telling the base station i think it was five and a half mils for channel two and twelve and a half for channel one and minus two and a half for monitor I believe that's the current levels. And no, you didn't want to put your finger across those phone lines when you were using this thing. It would it would hurt. Ask me how I know. Anyway, that's a brief explanation of how that works. Let's get the schematic out. I'll put you down here a minute and let you look at my phone. Look what I got in the mail today. Boys and girls. Motorola Remote Control Console T1200 Series. I just wish mine had the clock. The clock and the VU meter on this thing would have been fantastic. But it didn't have neither one. This was the El Cheapo version. 
Let's see, there's another picture of it. Really stunning. I love this old stuff. Let's see here. Here's some specifications on this bad boy. Guaranteed performance specifications. Let me turn my viewfinder. Model of again, this is a T1200. Let's see, basic unit, a TLN 6017 compression line amplifier and power supply. The tube and semiconductor complement. Make sure you can see. It uses a 2N651 mic preamp. That's that little transistor I showed you a few minutes ago that was all green and crusty. We're not even going to trust that. I'm going to find a replacement for it and change it. The 6AQ5 is the audio power amplifier. And then there's a uh, 2T1 compression diode. Uh, two of them. Two little, little like germanium diodes. And there's that $200 12AX7 voltage amplifier and then two HD2149 compression rectifiers. That's a couple more little silicone or germanium looking trend, uh, diode. Uh, let's see, the power input. Is this really too bright, guys? Has this really got a lot of glare? It just looks like on this viewfinder it's a lot of glare. Let's see if I can fix that. I guess that's fine. Is that too much glare, y'all? Hmm. It might be. Let's, let's move you over here to the bench. Is that too much? That's even more. My goodness, I can't find nothing that's right. What about that? That better? A little shadow. Anyway, the power input to this thing is 40 watts at 117 volts, 50, 60 cycles. DC control voltage range is 4 milliamp to 40, 4 milliamp at 40 volts, 10 milliamp at 130 volts. Maximum open circuit voltage is 140 volts DC. Metering, standard VU meter plus a VU uh, reference level. We don't have a VU meter, but anyway, this thing weighs 26 pounds, believe it or not. Of course, the dimensions, uh, we don't need to know that, okay? The receive side of this thing, the inputs is a 600 ohm line, balanced. It also has a spot for auxiliary receiver, unbalanced. Audio input level for beginning of compression, adjustable maximum sensitivity equals minus 20 dBm at 1,000 th cycles for 1 kilohertz. And then the auxiliary receiver is plus 6 dBm at 1,000 cycles. Frequency response 300 to 3,000 cycles, 1,000 cycle reference. Uh, at 300 cycles, the uh, frequency response is plus 1 dB to minus 3.5 dB. At 3,000 cycles, at 0 dB, plus or minus 2 dB, plus 1 dB to minus 3. All right, and then the auxiliary receiver, which I've never, nobody I know has ever used it, plus 2 to plus 6 dB, which is fairly fairly large. That's actually, plus 4 is what we use on our line level stuff in broadcast, so yeah, it's not too bad. All right, so 0 dB plus or minus 2 dB is, uh, I think, let's see here. I think that's the reference level. Anyway, compression. With audio input increase of 30 dB, sound like Bugs Bunny, 30 dB beyond start of compression, output level increases less than 3 dB. So in other words, the signal can go uh, up quite a bit. 30 dB is quite a bit. And I can't tell you exactly how much, but 30 dB is quite a bit of audio. Uh, but anyway, let's see. Output level increases more than 3 dB, so it's go. It can change. Uh, it can change 30 dB and only change 3 dB on the output level. And basically, all that compression means is uh, is uh, it keeps. Uh, it's, it's kind of like an AVC or an AGC circuit. Uh, it just, uh, as your signal level gets higher, your compression starts kicking in to drop it. So you just really turn the compression to where it uh, limits your, uh, it just, uh, it limits your uh, amount of gain uh, through the system. In other words, less signal, less compression. More signal, more compression. It's just trying to keep it at a constant level. 
Uh, signal to noise ratio more than 45 dB. The audio output 3 watts maximum without compression with less than 3% distortion. Reference 117 volts AC input and 3.2 on load. Transformer line balance more uh, better than 70 dB. All right, transmit side. Oh boy. Audio input, low impedance, dynamic microphone, Motorola models T532 and 533A. Low impedance and high level microphone, low impedance dynamic microphone with built-in transistorized preamp. All right, and then sensitivity for plus uh, 10 dBm out at the near compression, 0.4 millivolts. And high level microphone, minus 18. Frequency response, again, is 300 to 3,000 cycles. So 300 cycles, so frequency response is plus 1 to minus 3.5 dB. Uh, let's see, and then high level microphone is about the same. And then 3,000 cycles, this is about the same, plus 1 to minus 3 dB, and then plus or minus 2 dB. All right, compression, uses the same compressor, so it does the same thing. 30 dB beyond start of compression, output level increases less than 3 dB. Noise hum level is less than 32, minus 32 dBm. Audio output, 18 dBm maximum without compression, less than 3% distortion. So there's your specs on this bad boy, such as it is. And I really think we're better off with this light over here. It's more comfortable for me. I, I'm hoping it's good. have this in an electronic version so in case anybody's interested there's your patents here is the model chart this is all the various models that you can get which I have the T1200A and then there's an old 1201 1202 1203 1204 1206 all these do different things. You get one well, mine is a single frequency, and then there's a two frequency, and then a single frequency with clock and VU meter, two frequency with clock and VU meter, single frequency with PL disable switch, clock and VU meter, two frequency with clock and VU meter. Uh, let's see, single frequency again. Um, that's a T1207. Not sure what the deal is on a T1207. The 1200A, two frequency with PL disable, and two frequency, uh, the 1209 is two frequency with PL disable switch clock and VU meter. And then if we, this uh, Motorola loves to use the, the matrix charts. You just say, oh, I got this right here, so this would go to the X here and it's going to tell you what all inside it. So mine is going to have a TLN 6017A amplifier and power supply. So let's see if we can identify that. May not be able to. TLN 6017A right there. So we good there identified that so far all right then the next one we got another X they just got a THN 6011 housing so let's see if we can find that might not never actually had to look for one of these things before and that may be the outer shell I bet that's what that is Let's see, the front bezel is a TGN 6010A. Let's see if we can find that. TGN 6010A, front panel, single frequency, less clock and meter. So, anyway, that's what we have. And then it comes up here and it tells you about all the different things that's in this rig. All the different things, communication line facilities. Um, let's read a little bit on that. That may be fun. We love reading. Communication channels available for remote control operation of two-way radio equipment are usually obtained from the facilities installed for normal telephone services. 
These facilities consist of conductors at various gauges, non loaded and loaded circuits, and may contain repeating coils, composite sets, or other intermediate equipment. For these reasons, the resistance, impedance, and transmission frequency characteristics of channels differ, depending upon the location of the terminals of the existing facilities. Also, as communication systems change and improvements are made, the characteristics of the channels available between two points may be changed. Channels for service up to approximately 20 miles are usually obtained from cable facilities. Metallic paths are generally employed for such channels when speech or tones in the voice range are to be transmitted. When initially connected, it may be found that the pair does not transmit DC. The telephone company may have repeating coils installed in the, line, in the line. Therefore, it may be necessary to provide for DC transmission. The T1200 series remote control console is designed to provide DC control over the same pair as used for audio to wire control. If absolutely necessary, however, separate wires can be used for DC control for wire. Uh, when circuits are longer than 20 miles, a telephone company may be unable to provide communication circuits which are for transmit frequencies, which will transmit frequencies below 250 cycles. Therefore, the DC control will have to be on a separate pair. The upper limit of the frequency band transmitter generally limited by the cutoff frequency of loading systems, which is approximately through uh, 2,750 cycles to 3,500 cycles. Where non-loaded facilities are employed for channels above 3,000 cycles, the telephone company may load these circuits for general service reasons. The Motorola t model T1200A series remote control consoles are designed to meet all telephone company specifications regarding specific levels of DC voltages impressed on the line. Whew, a lot. And then it has all the various pre-operational adjustments and installations, uh, line levels, uh, let's see, all the adjustments that you're supposed to do. And look at there. Tells you about all this stuff right here. This is referenced somewhere else. J1, K1, R1, R14, uh, R15, C14, C9, F1, TB2, C13, R. CR6 and 7, T2, R27 compression bias control, I told you that's what that was, T3, 6AQ5 power amplifier, metering point A, hot diggity, and then a 12AX7, $200 uh, voltage amplifier tube, uh, V1, TB1, and T1, oh, there you go, ain't that cool, this book, this manual is just impressively. And of course it gives you all this stuff here. What all these terminals do on the back. Uh, your microphone, which is what normally goes in here. Uh, your microphone level adjustment right there. Your line input level. Your line output level. Your fuse. Your line cord. Uh, then you got your, here's your terminals here. This is where your um, uh, two wire line goes into one and two right there. And then if you're using the uh, uh, it says supervisory control. I've never seen one of them, those things you use. Auxiliary receiver, which I've never seen that used. Uh, let's see. Quick call console. I'm not worried about that. Footer, push to talk switch here. Uh, external speaker. If you wanted to have another speaker in your office uh, somewhere else, then monitor what this thing is here, and then you would hook a speaker there. Might do that too. Stream that. I don't know. Transistorized or carbon microphone. This is where your high impedance microphone would go. And then, of course, your microphone would go here. And then, you know, see, DC only for our jumpers. That's uh, just for DC operation. Blah, blah, blah. A lot of stuff to it. Well, let's see, what do we have here? Here is your microphone right here. And I don't have a microphone, I'll show you what it is. But the first thing is, is your microphone level control right there. Here's your little mic preamp right there. That's that little green crusty transistor. Uh, here's your uh, level, microphone in, level right here. It's just a, uh, uh, this is just the output level uh, coming from this preamp and it feeds it over here through this relay contact to let's see uh, let's back up a second that my, these microphones require bias 
So let's see here. Yeah, this is for the transistor rise. It requires a bias. So this is the bias circuit right here that's coming from the 220 volts of the power supply through this filter, through this 10K, through this filter, through this 25K, 10 watt, my goodness, 22K, 50, 50 microfarad capacitor through the 560 ohm resistor and sends a bias voltage back, to, I think it's 22 volts, to your transistorizer carbon microphone. And then, uh, but your base microphone that's designed to go with this, this, um, this comes this way. So when you, uh, when you transmitter, you're speaking in the microphone, your audio goes this way. Comes through this preamp, goes through this uh, output level control, comes down. And when you hit transmit, that goes through this section of the relay. This is a normally open. Oh, that's uh, in the, uh, well, this is in the normally closed. This is normally open. So when you t put your microphone, press your key on your microphone, this closes. So this contact moves down here. So your audio comes down here, comes through here, and goes into a couple of places. Well, actually, it goes into this place. I apologize. Comes in right here to the voltage amplifier. That $200 uh, 12AX7. Uh, let's see here. Then it's amplified. And uh, this is all by circuitry right here. Uh, anyway, it's amplified, applied to the voltage amplifier right here, which is nothing more to twin triode tube, a little 12x7. Signal from the microphone comes in here, amplified right there, applied to the grid of this voltage amplifier, second half of the 12x7, then goes through the coupling cap, applied to the power amp tube, the 6AQ5 pentode. Why is it called pentode? Because it has one, two, three, four, five elements. Pentode, triode, three, trio, plate, uh, control grid, cathode. And that's what all that means. Uh, if you ain't quite sure what it means, go find you on eBay a tube, uh, an RCA tube manual, receiving tube manual. Get it in and you can just study to your heart's desire. Anyway, uh, going back to the audio amplifier. So you've keyed the microphone, you're speaking into it, your audio. Uh, is amplified and these two tubes applied to the output amplifier which drives this transformer the uh, all this circuitry here is all feedback and this is what adjusts all your compression here and uh, I don't want to bore you with that anyway your audio is brought in comes in through here it's uh, joins right there comes back down here comes through this relay when you in other words when you when you hit transmit all this stuff close moves so right now your audio is coming from your output transformer, which is this guy, is your primary. It's attached to plate. Uh, it transforms it through this secondary, and it winds up going all the way over here, bouncing back, coming back over here, coming down, coming through here. When the relay is closed, so it pulls in. This contact is down here, so it comes around here, through here to your line output control. And from there, it's applied through this little filter, this little uh, impedance matching network right here, to this primary of the uh, line coil. That's that square transformer, and it's applied to the secondaries of this guy, and that's where the audio leaves the remote control. Now, next thing that happens is while you've got this thing keyed, it has to impress 12. Uh, it has to impress 140 volts across these lines right here. Well, it does that by right here injecting this. See these capacitors there? That two microfarad right there? That is what uh, bypasses the audio path between this coil, and, I mean this side of the transformer and this side of the transformer. But your DC is injected right here. So if you follow all this mess down, this side here goes through a jumper. This one here goes through a jumper. So these two little dudes right here is uh, 18 and 16 and they'll come back over here and they'll go through this little relay here that's that that's that big relay I showed you a minute ago so when you key down it's basically the the DC path going from where it's winding up to where it's coming from it's coming through here coming down coming through these relays coming back out coming over here to this power supply right there and um, so this is where the 140 volts comes from. This little net system right here, this series of filters. Uh, you got uh, 25 by 25 and a 25. 
through a couple of 1Ks. That's that black resistor I showed you guys a few minutes ago. Uh, that black capacitor I showed you all ago and I didn't know what was in it. That's what it is, 325 microfarads. Anyway, uh, that's where its voltage comes from. And then the other side, of course, gets this ground of the capacitors. Uh, and that's the DC circuit. Uh, kind of a quick and dirty way of explaining what these things, uh, how these things basically work. Um, the main power supply is right here. It's got a two, uh, it's a uh, full wave rectifier, CR6 and 6 and 7. That's those two green seleniums that we showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, then here's the first filter. Uh, filter A is going to be a 30 microfarad. So that signal comes out here, comes down here, comes up here to the screen grid of the uh, 6AQ5, goes through this transformer to the plate. You're already seeing this circuit. And of course, um, let's see where to go. Right here, this uh, 200, uh, how much voltage was that? 220. Also comes up here, comes up here to this bias network that we talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, let's see, coming back over here, that's all that does. And see, and then we come back over here, and then the center tap of that dude comes out. And this gives the keying relay voltage to operate. Uh, of course, I'll reference the ground. There's another filter cap right there. So it's not a whole lot to it. You know, it uh, definitely want to poke your hand around in that thing. It is tube type, and it's got various other features to it there. That, you know, different things. You know, this is front panel, C chart. Got your speaker with your volume control. It's got your pilot light. It's got your clock. And it's got your VU meter, volume unit meter. This in here has got the front panel, which is your frequency one, frequency two, and your receiver mute. Uh, another option. And then your monitor for switch right here for, you know, private line systems. Uh, let's see what else here. Two position, got just a frequency one, frequency two, clock, and VU meter. All kinds of stuff in here that I don't have on mine. Boo-hoo. Uh, that's a quick rundown of this little T1200 remote. Um, it'll be a neat little project. I'm just going to head and mark everything and go ahead and take the board off and go ahead and clean the board. Uh, get it good and clean, inspect all the components on it, go ahead and text every resistor on it, and I'm going to check every resistor on this thing. Uh, and try to find Alan Bradley's to replace any resistor because I want it 100%. The only thing that's going to be different is going to be the filter caps. Um, I said I wasn't going to restuff them. But you know me if you watch any of my videos. I might restuff them. Depends. I decided. We'll see. Anyway, that's my little project I'm going to start on. Uh, of course, I've got, I don't have to paint it. I don't have to take the stuff off the chassis. That's uh, going to take the audio transformers off. The, all the stuff that's that can get stuff in it, and I'm going to take all that off. And, and we'll see if I can clean this chassis with a little uh, navel jelly and stuff like that, and get that corrosion and all that off there, and clean that chassis up. Uh, try not to damage any writing on it if I can. Uh, try to keep it original as possible. I'll have to paint the front bezel. I'm going to try cleaning it, but I think it's stained. And the outside cover, I do have the outside cover, but uh, it's it's going to have to be sanded down and repainted because it's pretty rough. Um, so that's what I got to do on that right there. So uh, I don't know what next I will make video I'm going to make of this, but this is where I'm going to start it. So I'm probably going to go ahead and take pictures of that audio compression board and go ahead and uh, undo everything and uh, take it out and get it out of the way and I'll probably take that audio trend and get in the way and start getting it ready for uh, for cleaning so uh, contrary to my other videos I won't show all that I'll just show you what happens once it looks like when I get it all apart Anyway, that's it for now. Uh, talk to you later. Bye. 
All right, I got all the wires on solder from the audio compression board. So let's pull it out. It wasn't a big deal. I just took my iPhone and uh, made a bunch of pictures of it. Pulling the, all the wires off the top side and the bottom the transformer too. So, oh, hang on, gotta get, gotta get the right tool, Mister. I'm always prepared. Just so happens I have the right tool. Can you see that? My uh, trusty dusty XL Lite 99 uh, PS-50 screwdriver nut driver set US of A. 13 pieces. Yes, sir. Nothing but the best for this old radio. My other name uh, that I use Sam's Radio TV and Electronics. Let's take about four screws out. No biggie, I'm sure you got, whoa, Sambo, I'm sure you guys have taken screws out before, it ain't no big thing, let's see, see, just taking it out, I could probably clean this up, but I would rather it out of the way when I start using um, the navel jelly and everything to clean this main board, this main chassis up. And I don't know about the power supply transformer. Uh, There's a lot of connections on it. It ain't like your old tube type radio that you always work on or see people work on, whatever. Let's see if I got everything taken out. Look at there. This thing hadn't been out since the date it was manufactured sometime in 1966. little bit dirty I'm kind of eager to test these little capacitors right here uh, maybe good may not be I don't know look ma got a hole in the chassis All right, next thing I want to do is I want to pull this transformer Take pictures of that. I don't know if you think you can see it or not. Take pictures of where you can. Oh, it's in me out the wrong way. Let's see, where's my. I think it's got a ground lead right here. I've got to undo. Then this red and yellow right here. And then this wire right here, which I can't tell if a bluish or something like this. I don't know. I think that's all. And I'll pull all these out and uh, get that transformer out. I won't bug y'all. I'll show. I'll bring you back in a minute. Okay. I've got the uh, got the audio output transformer pulled. Um, like a little bit of issue going on with some of the rubber wiring. I'll have to investigate that. Uh, I'll clean that off later off camera. So let's see, where am I at? Um, still got the audio, uh, the uh, line transformer right here, and the relay here. I'm not messing with that. Um, the power transformer here. I'm trying to decide if I want to take that out too. However, it's got one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten wires attached to it, not counting the ones coming out of this side. And I'm trying to decide if that's something I want to do. Yep. I decide if that's something I want to do, y'all. 
the reason I'm thinking about taking it out so I can get in here to this clean this like it should not too bad here I think all this will clean up good and I may just go ahead and navel jelly it and see what happens I'm going to give it a good wipe down first see how that does and put a little green stuff on it and see what happens so I'll do that anything worth reporting I'll be back now I did a little exploratory uh, wipe down of that right there and uh, used my little uh, scotch bright pad Um, I really don't want to pull that transformer. I don't know. I want to think about that a little while. Anyway, I'm going to end it right there. It's getting late. I'm tired, so I'm going to cut it loose. Anyway, thanks for watching. All right, bye, golly. I don't know if I'll ever find this thing put back together or not, but there, all the transformer leads are out. So I'm going to uh, take the transformer off and I'll see what else it looks like. Be right back. There you go, guys. We've all been waiting for one power transformer. Not too terribly bad. We'll need a little work. I think it'll clean up nice. The leads still bend and they don't snap, so that's a good sign. So, so the audio output transformer from the audio amp stage and the power transformer that gives it power to do everything it does. So let's see what the other side looks like now. Yeah. That's better. That's much better. I believe that's workable. So the next phase is uh, take this section. Well, actually, I'm going to take these wires off after marking them uh, because this is all fungus here. This is all uh, mold, I think. Or the wire, uh, or the clock, this uh, decom. Uh, com I'm so tired, I can't talk. This may be decomposition, and I'm looking at these wires right here. I got to look at that and inspect that closely because I may have to change some wiring in this thing. I hope not. Anyway, I'm going to take that loose. All that's off camera. That's boring. And the next thing I'll do is I'll pull this chassis out, and uh, that'll be for tomorrow, I think. So I'll pull this chassis out, take it to the other building, and get the uh, naval jelly hold of it, see if we can get a bunch of this crap off there and get this chassis cleaned up. Once we get the chassis cleaned up, then we can evaluate all the parts and everything that we'll need, uh, get them ordered from wherever, and then uh, I'll clean the circuit board here, get that circuit board cleaned up, clean this uh, transformer up right here, get it nice cleaned up, and it shouldn't take a lot. I'll clean this thing up here, give it a quick little painting, uh, no problem there. Get the chassis cleaned up, clean all this plastic up, get this discussion cleaned up, uh, get it back together so we can go ahead and get it operational. You know, after we change all the parts, change the components, I haven't decided about uh, these caps yet. Um, it would look better if I stuffed them, but i got to think about that. Uh, so anyway. Uh, I'll bring you back uh, next time. Bye bye. All right, it's another day uh, on this Motorola T1200 DC remote control. I went and cleaned it. Uh, I've taken it out of the case. Uh, I've went and cleaned it. This is all rusty up, rusted up, and uh, it's going to have power transformer here and that's going to have the audio output transformer here uh, this is another one of those judgment calls this thing is uh, because of what it is I don't think I'm going to go too deep into I'm just I clean all the rust off of it and um, 
it's got some residual on there but I'm not going to worry about it not for what it's going to do this is not like it's a, a collectible item this is just something that I want to use it's, uh, basically it's a real fancy line amplified speaker and transmitter all it is anyway I, I cleaned it up uh, chassis cleaned up rather well got all the all the rat pee off of it and all that kind of stuff um, the PC board which is the audio amp compression board the heart of the system it cleaned up rather well I just uh, took it to the sink put some uh, oh what was that stuff called simple green I think it was on there and it cleaned it up real good I used a brush warm water and so now I just got to go in check all the resistors and check all these capacitors I know this one's bad for sure and I'm pretty sure every one of them is going to be bad as far as electrolytics but I'm going to go in and check them all check the components this is the transistor here that uh, yeah, clean the daylight side of it you can't tell but I'm going to check this trans I'm going to pull this transistor I'm not going to use it but I'm going to see if I can find a replacement for it uh, that, that thing is pretty rotten. The bottom of it didn't really do a whole lot to. It's got some heat damage on the board, but this old, uh, this old plastic board here, uh, I think it's phenolic too, if I'm not mistaken. I may be wrong, but you see it's got a little black around it. That's where the 6AQ5 was. Uh, and this thing runs continuous, so it's going to have a little bit of heat damage on there. So anyway, it's cleaned up good, so I'm not worried about it. Uh, the line transformer cleaned up good. I used a little vinegar on it, cleaned it up, cleaned the uh, cover of the uh, the uh, T -re TR relay. It cleaned up all right. Uh, some of you are probably thinking, why didn't you go in there and make it completely new? Well, this is not a collectible radio. This is just something for me. Um, I just wanted to get all that layer of filth over, it, clean it off. It's sterilized, so not too worried about it. Um, but I'm going to go through this board right here, see what all's wrong with it, you know, you know. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of that. I'll just uh, get a parts list of what I need, which I, uh, I want to check these two here. I, I haven't dealt with these a whole lot. I've never had to change anything like that. But it's .005 microfarad at 600 volts. Um, I'm going to see how those check. It seems to have one, two, three in there. Uh, then I have, uh, let's see here, some Motorola branded 25 microfarad, 50 volt capacitor, one in there. Uh, 100 microfarad, can't tell the voltage. Uh, another 25 microfarad, so it's probably the same as the other one, 50 volt, yeah. And then I can't really tell what that is. There's two of them little brown ones there. I'll check them too and uh, check all these other components on this board, see how close they are. You know, I get this board reconditioned and I'll, uh, I'll just bring you back when I get that done. Uh, let's see, the next thing that this thing will need, uh, we'll take the transformer here, clean it up just a little bit. Uh, I might just uh, rough it up with some uh, Scotch Bright Green and uh, rough it up good and uh, give it another dose of black. But all I'm going to probably do that. I'm also going to map out these wires here and I'll go ahead and write those values down and then this is the audio output transformer uh, it's got that little bit of fungus I think that is growing on there so I gotta take a closer look at that see if that's something I can get rid of uh, but otherwise you can get the transformers back in there get them cleaned up painted and all that get the transformers back in here uh, the only other thing that I know to do will repair this board here and then these three capacitors here, these three can capacitors, which has got four, eight, nine, I think this one has three, two or three in it. So it's eight, nine, ten, or eleven capacitors in all here. Uh, the capacitors on this board, and what else? I'm thinking everything, oh, there's an electrolyte right there. Uh huh. And then there's two here, which are more than likely good. I'm going to call them good, and I'm going to check the resistors and everything in there. And, um, well, I guess that's about it. Then I'll check all these pots. These pots probably just need to be cleaned. But I think we'll go and get it. Uh, that's an update for now. All right. Bring you back when there's something worth talking about. Bye. Okay. Um, we're back. Um, Got all the capacitors pulled out of the uh, 
the rig and uh, handful of them that was just out of the uh, compression board and that's just all the electrolytics so um, let me see if I can figure out how to do this quite like that angle so uh, how can we do this have a seat in a chair so I can instead of standing let's see get this camera situated so I guess we can we're just going to check them first are these black ones right here I honestly don't know what they are they're Chicago made by manufactured by Chicago uh, it says here a point double oh five at 600 so I mean, you know, are not quite so round. About, I'd say about a little more than a quarter inch in diameter. Uh, probably about an inch wide. Uh, radio leads coming out the bottom, and you see what the bottom is. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what these are. Shame on me, I guess. We're going to see what they are together, as Mr. Carlson says. It says it's a capacitor 5,347 picofarads, which would be a 005. So, okay. That's cool. Let's see if there's any leakage. We'll bring you gorilla style here. My favorite word, apparently. Let's see if I can get all this in one shot. That's the capacitor right there. It's attached to my trusty old heat kit condenser checker. Uh, let's see, the model number of this old thing is uh, model C is in Charlie dash three. See Charlie. Anyway, let's look at the value. Put it on selector switch 0.001 to 0.5, and let's see, that would be the scale right here. So let's watch the eyeball. Oh, hang on, gotta change that paper mica. Yeah, we just tune this until our eye opens up. Somewhere in there, what's it say? Uh, point double oh five. Look at there. That kind of feel makes you feel good. Let's do a leakage test. Watch that eye. See that? I, I didn't stutter at all. See that? I forgot what the voltage was on this. Six hundred volt capacitor. Let's just bring it all the way to 450 volts, see what it does. That is a good capacitor. I'm not sure what those are. Like I said a few minutes ago, I don't know exactly what those kind are. Um, but it checks good. So that's going to get reused. Well, put that in a good pile. All right. Here's another one identical to it. I'm gonna do the same thing. Let's just use this capacitor tester here instead of the other one. I like this though Heath kit. It works pretty good. Uh, it hasn't really gave me any uh, any trouble. I had to do a little work on it when I first got it. I tube is getting a little on the dim side. Tell you what. Let's see. Turn that light off. You don't see better? Oh yeah. Okay, so let's try it. We're going to change this back down. Range switch capacitance test. We're going to adjust it till the eye moves open. Maximum deflection on the eye, which is wide open. And look at there, 0 0.005 again. So let's come back over here to leakage test. Watch the eye. See that eye flip open fast? We're going to go to 250 volts. Remember, this is a 600 volt capacitor. 
Yep, that did good. Let's bring it up to 450 as high as this one will go. Here we go. Look at there. Looks good. All right. Doing this one handed. There's a guy I watch um, on YouTube. Uh, Pine Hollow Auto Diagnostics. His name is Ivan. He's a crazy little Russian. He's American, but he I guess he's got Russian ancestry. They're always talking about, you know, Russian repair, whatever. But anyway, he's a very good diagnostic technician, auto technician. Not only does he work on cars, you know, vehicles and such, he works on uh, these uh, uh, air lifts and all these genie lifts and all this other kind of stuff. And uh, he's very smart. Uh, learned a lot from him uh, as far as automotives go. Don't make me an expert. Okay, we're going to normal. We're on the back on the capacitance test right here. Uh, watching the eyeball, and we're going to just tune. Look at that eyeball. Where it's at. Point, a little over point double oh five. Hey, how about that? How about them crackers? I'm just gonna go for the go for the go. I'm at the 450 volt level. I'm just gonna quit wasting time on that. Boom. Nothing wrong with that cap at all. How about that? That's fantastic. I get to reuse all three of those. Now we're down to these two. Poor old pitiful looking brown ones here. Look at the end of it. See how the brown is cracked on it? I don't know if you can see it or not. I don't know if this thing is focusing or not. I can't really tell. But trust me though, it, I wouldn't leave it in there if it did check good. I think this is a 10 at 50. So let's just put it on this capacitor tester right here. It doesn't really matter about polarity. I want to see what this thing says. A little Chung King tester right here. It's been pretty good though. It'll check uh, transistors and uh, it'll check capacitors, inductors, uh, transistors, uh, diodes. I think for the twenty dollars I paid for it, it, does a really good job. It says it's a fourteen microfarad ESR of 0.33 ohms. How about that? I didn't expect that. Nope, I did not expect that. It says it's a 10 at 50 volts, if I read that right. So let's find out. Let's put this on our trusty dusty tester here. Our trusty dusty uh, heath kit. Let's see how Ivan. You know what I was talking about, Ivan, a while ago. He's a great automotive te technician, and uh, and there's Eric O with um, South Main Auto as well. Those two I watch regularly. Uh, I just wish we had competent technicians like them in anywhere. Eric, I have not. I, in this town I live in. And the adjacent towns does not have any competent diagnostic technicians. They're all parts changers or they shoot the parts cannon and stuff. Don't know what the hell they're talking about. I don't trust any of them. Anyway, let's tr check this capacitor. I think it's supposed to be a 10 at 25. So I've got it on the 0.1 to 50 uh, microfarad scale. So let's just see. Now it's going to be electrolytic. So we have to change the power factor switch from paper mica which I didn't show you a minute ago, paper mica to electrolytic, and always start off on zero. So what we want to do is we just want to see, we want to point one scale, uh, where would that be, point one, point one, point one, this scale right here. Oh, I'm sorry, I want to forget I got you in So we're probably looking for this, so let's just tune it, let's just tune to see what happened. Let's just tune, I'm tuning. Oh, got an indication. All right, look at there. A little over 10. Now, what you do next, you rotate the power factor till you get maximum opening of the eye. When you get maximum, you come back over here to your adjustment. Peak it. Now, the uh, 
the capacitor checker or condenser checker is now calibrated for that capacitor value and it's reading a little over 10 microfarad now that we have that since it's a 25 we're just going to put it in the 25 look at there I would not have believed it as rough as that capacitor looks it checks good as rough as this capacitor checks it checks good I just wish y'all could see what the front, the front of it looks like as much as I want to uh, now going back to this a minute so like if that's a 50 volt cap I can't check it on 50 volts I can go from 25 volts to 150 volts leakage I can't go to 50 but that, that little dude surprised me it's just a testament to how well Motorola motors made their stuff back in the day. This stuff was built like tanks, I'm telling you. Never again in the history of this planet will there be anything built as well as it was back in the 60s and 50s and 40s. I'm telling you. Now, I don't know what value this is. We'll just test it. I don't have a clue. Let's see if we can find a value. I'm Oh, we may have an open one here. Let me double check. Let's see here. I don't see nothing on that range. I'm at the point one to 50. Let's go to the 20 to 1,000. I think that capacitor, now that one seems to be open. Let's put it on the 25 volt scale. You see how that eye just popped open? That capacitor is completely bad. Let me discharge this capacitor in case it did have a little bit of a charge on it. I don't want to hook that up if it's got any kind of voltage to it. Let's put it on this dude. I think this capacitor is bad. And that's the other thing about the little Chung King tester here is uh it doesn't matter you put it on any of these three leads and if it's even can identify it it'll tell you what the leads are Let's see look no unknown or damaged part now, that's a bad one now that other one that was just like it check good perfect this one didn't yeah this was a 20 at 25 it didn't even act like a part. Excuse me just a minute. <sighs> Sorry about that. About an hour ago my nose, I started sneezing and I have, a, my nose has been running ever since. Oh, drop the stupid thing. Oh, clumsy fingers. All right, here's another one, another capacitor out of this thing, Motorola. Uh, 100 microfarad at, microfarad at 6 volts. Uh, now, that's going to be hard to test for leakage on my tester. Sure. But, we can at least check the value. And, uh, what did I say that was, y'all? Remind me. 100 at 6 volts so okay here we go 100 let's just turn the dial we got a little bit of an indication right there all right let's peek it with the uh power factor it all the way up now what's it say i'm on the 20 to 1000 scale uh that would be where <laughs> uh, where is it? Here it is, right here. So it's showing me about 180 microfarad. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I trust that one. You look what the power factor is. I've never seen one of the power factor go up that high. But like I say, I can only check 25. Oh, what the hell? Of course, we've exceeded it.
Uh, we'll put that aside. I want to check it with a nonmeter. This one here is a 25 at 50. Let's check it. Uh, we'll put the polarity. You have to observe the polarity on these things. Of course, if you've ever done any of this stuff, you ought to know that. But if you didn't, you're new to this hobby, well, okay. 20, what did I say this was, guys? It's another Motorola branded capacitor. Uh, I wonder if I can pick up the phone and call Motorola and order new ones. Anyway, 25 at 50. Oh, 25 at 50. Yeah, 25 at 50. That's why I have such trouble. All right, let's see. Let's turn that power factor back down to zero. Let's tune the eye. Oh, we, now that's how the other one should have responded. That other one was leaky. I'm pretty sure of it. All right, let's turn the power factor. It seems to be... I'm going to tune off a little bit. Alright, so what do we got? We're on the 20 to 100 scale. Yeah, this one's reading... Uh, where's my scale at here? 20 to 100. I always I can never find it. I'm sorry, 20 to 1000. So let's just check in about 30, 32. Uh, okay. Well. Got to drop everything, everybody. Phone call. Sorry about the interruption. I forgot where I was at. 25 at 50. All right, here we go. Well, it took the charge. That 25. Let's go up. Well, I can't go up to 150. We'll do it briefly. I'm going to say that's fine. Let's see. I don't know. Um, that's, the, that's the one thing I don't like about this rig. Is it my, I can't check these medium sized capacitors. Uh, anyway, it's going to get replaced. Now, what does this do right here? It's the same thing. It's a 25 at 50. Anyway, I, uh, I started sneezing a while ago and I have not stopped running nose is running now let's see 25 to 50 25 50 I've got it uh, connected and I've got uh, electrolytic that's what that means is electrolytic on this here so let's see look at there guys no indication very very bottom but that's how it does when you bottom it out uh, let's just change it yeah, nothing. Let's check it for leakage. Yeah, that capacitor is open. See? I exceeded this voltage level. And that capacitor is completely open. So, as you see, one of these checked fantastic like a brand new one. This one here didn't work at all. And uh, one out of these checked okay. I don't know why the leakage because I couldn't get that low in voltage that's a six volt these two are 50 volts I can't do 50 volts I could do 25 but they check weird these three out of all of those one two three four five six seven eight uh, out of eight of them three of them check good these here I like the looks of them they don't appear to be bad they ain't got no leakage and I checked them up to 475 volts which is more than that thing generates uh, I'm gonna put them back in the circuit so these guys here get to be either Get to be the replacement. Now, this little dude here, this transistor, as you can see, looks pretty rough, pretty green. I said in the previous video that I was going to replace it, but let's see, let's see where that transistor is. Oh my lord, my stump, my nose is killing me, guys. I know I sound nasal all of a sudden. Where is it? Uh, is it pretty empty? Y'all see that? Uh, la la la. Q1. Uh, it's a PNP. Gonna be a PNP germanium, more than likely. Uh, Q1 does not give me the value of it. Let's see if it's in here. Da, 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 Q1. Where is Q1? Parts list. Q1. Here's CR. Anybody see a Q1? There's Q1. 
It's a Motorola part number 48A as an atom 124313. I'm going to call Motorola and see if they got one. It is a 2N651 PNP. I told you it was germanium too. Anyway, let's put it on the handy dandy tester. And once again, I'll do this one handed. Just because I like doing things the hard way. Actually, I don't. I don't like doing things the hard way. Anyway, I got the transistor connected. So let's find out what it does. Oh, look. Binary junction transistor. Bipolar junction transistor. Uh, I think that's what it means. Anyway, PNP. Uh, and it checks... Uh, checks good. Well, I think I'm going to clean the corrosion off of it and uh, reinstall it. So, anyway, uh, component tests have done. I uh, don't know what I'll do next, but we'll figure it out. See you in a little bit. Alright, uh, that area where that transistor was, yo, uh, was pretty rough. After Even after I cleaned the board, it was pretty rough. It still had a lot of corrosion on it. And even though most of the, just about every, I, well, let me back up. All the resistors actually checked. All these Allen Bradleys on here, every one of them checked good. But this trans area where this transistor was was still some corrosion on there. And I got to looking. Uh, let's see this one here. This resistor here, even though it checked good, it's a 15K. That's that brown, green, orange. That's a one of five, and then three zeros. At uh, I think that's 10 percent tolerance anyway it checked good but it's green it's got corrosion on it and Allen Bradley's it's just uh, if you get corrosion on these things uh, resistors and trans some transistors too especially uh, plastic transistors if there's corrosion on there it will eat into the component so as a precaution I will change this component out the other ones I took went in and took all the components out of that area right there so that's what this big mess is I went ahead and put flux on the board flux uh, uh, it's a great board cleaner. I'm just letting it set on there, do its thing. I'm going to go back in here on my soldering iron and solder wick, and we'll clean all those off, and that should clean this area up where that transistor was. Uh, the transistor itself, like we talked about a few minutes ago, uh, it's green as all crap, but it's an encapsulated transistor. Uh, i got to look at it a little closer. I'm going to clean it up a little bit more, and I'm going to see if there's any corrosion on those legs. But if there's not, I'm thinking about just uh, maybe putting a little brasso on there, see if I get the corrosion off, or a Dremel. I don't really care if to see the value or not, but I'm going to see if I can clean it up, and we'll put it back in the circuit. And if it works, that's fine. If it gets noisy, that's fine too. But honestly, I'll never use this thing to transmit with. And I'm debating whether if I want to fix the transmit side because all I want this thing to do is receive. So, but then again, you know, that would take the fun out of it, but it would be a little cheaper. But, you know, uh, it's only three more capacitors in the transmit side than the receive side. So, I probably just change them all. I haven't decided how I'm going to do that yet. So, anyway. That's where I'm at on this, so I'm going to clean this board up and uh, a little bit more, and uh, and uh, I guess I'll bring you back next time there's an update. And this, oh yeah, this uh, film capacitor right here, it looks like a film capacitor at least, uh, it's an 047 at 100 volts, uh, I'm going to check it off, the, you know, check it, uh, just random check it, I think these will probably be fine. But I'm going to put it on the capacitor and condenser analyzer over there, the old heat kit, and see how good it is. And just because I got it out, I'm going to check it. Anyway, that's my that's my list right there. Uh, anyway, I will bring you back next time. There's an update. Bye. Okay, I uh, cleaned up rather well, y'all. Um, this is that area here. A lot of green, crusty corrosion right here where this transistor was. Uh, I cleaned all that area out right there. Just this little area where the transistor was. Pull these uh, resistors that came out of there. Remember that, uh, what was it, the 15K? I'm going to go ahead and change it. Because one of the things about uh, being in these uh, carbon composition resistors like this, the Allen Bradleys uh, are not as bad as the Roundies. But Allen Bradleys are the best resistors you could get at the time. 
and they're still very good uh, resistors. But anyway, when they're subjected to um, humidity and moisture and rat pee and all this other mess, it will affect these resistors. And what I'm afraid of is I'm going to have some noisy resistors, which means the carbon composition is decayed just a little bit. So when you pass current through it, uh, it generates noise. Uh, in the old days, uh, in the old telephone days, the little mouthpiece that you spoke in was carbon. And uh, as you spoke, it compressed a uh, diaphragm, and that diaphragm compressed that carbon, and uh, your carbon uh, was compressed and uncompressed, and it corresponded to your voice. Uh, and that, in effect, changed the resistance of the uh, element which uh, affected how much current well the resistance had a voltage on it and that created a varying current and that went through the line to the other side and went into the earpiece that's a simplistic way of work but my point is it's working just it, it does it creates noise the same way those old uh, carbon microphones used to do many thousands of years ago but anyway I digress but look at how clean that came I used uh, rosin core solder I mean uh, flocks. I use no clean flock paste. Uh, comes in this little tube. It's about fifteen dollars for this thing. MG Chemicals. Uh, let's see. There's your part number. Uh, you really don't need to smell this stuff. My nose is. Unfortunately, I don't have a uh, a. Uh, fume extractor right now I'm something on my bucket list but anyway my nose is already pouring mucus so I'm not too worried about it let it have some more and I was looking right here just now this is where all that corrosion was in this area look at that eyelet right there where that screw went through to the chassis it is completely ate away wow that rat pissed in this a little bit more and uh, I'm looking here I still have some spots that looks kind of sketchy, like that's kind of gray. I'll probably have to take care of that. Uh, let's see, I saw another one in here. Uh, they all look a little gray, but that one looks a little grayer. And uh, let's see, what else? Uh, that's mainly it, just in that area there. I may pull this cap up out of the way and get in there a little closer underneath it to clean it. But basically what I did is I used... Uh, no clean solder wick. I use that solder paste I just showed you, that flux I meant, but, but I use this too. I've had this. This stuff ain't cheap. Don't get the crap. Get the good stuff. And I use this. I've had this for years. A uh, big roll of it. Don't get the little small rolls. Get the big rolls. It's more economical. Anyway, NTE. I don't know if you can get that anymore. I got this since uh, Mr. Brooks uh, was in town here. Uh, but I've had this a long time. But that's some good stuff. Now, the reason I say, uh, going back to the flux, is uh, flux makes a great cleaner for cleaning circuit boards. So you just apply flux all over this right here. Get your soldering iron. In my case, this is my Heiko. I've been calling it Hacko, but it's Heiko FX951. And this is my tip right here. Ooh, don't look at that. That's my tip. Uh, when you buy these things, you're looking at about close, eh, about 350, uh, somewhere thereabouts. So when you get this model here, you can get it from Amazon. You get this. This comes. Uh, this uh, soldering iron comes with uh, this uh, power supply unit. Comes with this head. Comes with this uh, holder, which is adjustable. Uh, comes with this uh, tip cleaner, and it also comes with uh, one, two, three, four five tips in this really cool tip holder right here I don't think you can beat it I love that soldering iron so uh, anyway I'm just going to uh, continue cleaning this board and uh, trying to get it ready and then I'm going to order a million parts for it and then we'll be good to go bring it back okay still digging around with this audio compression board here for this T1200 I'll show you something I just found Look right there, that capacitor, if you can see it. See that leg, how dark it is? Get you a bit, a little bit more light. See that dark? You can see the copper on it. That 
pasture is compromised as a silver, silver mica uh, and that leg is compromised that will have to come out so I've cleaned this board up uh, pretty extensively you can see through the light saw it clean all the solder out of all the holes that I could find make my job easier re-putting all the components back in here I've cleaned this board several times I've actually cleaned it under the sink but it's still still is not it's, it's got something on it I don't know if that's that flux or what but uh, I've already had ISO on it a couple of times and some electronic cleaner and uh, washed it under the sink a couple of times and dried it off. But it's just still like like right underneath these resistors right here. It's all nasty. It's got uh, flux residue from years ago underneath it and all kinds of mess. I'm thinking about, man, I don't want to depopulate this board to clean this thing, but I don't know. I gotta, this thing is not clean as I want it to be, and it's proven to be tough. And this is supposed to be a simple little board. If you turn it around here, look under right there. Uh, Man, I'm going to have to wind up depopulating this whole board. Man, I don't want to do that. So, I don't know. I'm, let me think about it. Well, here we are. This turned out to be a pain in their posterior. But I had to pull most of these components, well, lift one side of them up, one leg of them up to clean underneath them because this board still has some kind of fungus, I mean, just funky residue. And most of these components I had to pull up to get under them like this the capacitor here. These resistors here, uh, let's see, these diodes right here, um, these resistors right here, um, these resistors here. Um, I had to pick every, pull every one of them up out of the way and use alcohol pads uh, to clean underneath them. Uh, but it looks really, it's a lot better now. Went ahead and put these black capacitors in, whatever they are. And the only thing that concerns me is under these tube sockets. I uh, don't know what's underneath there. I hope it ain't funky. Uh, but I have an idea. Because these, I've tried to do this before. When I wor actually worked on one of these years ago. And the tube socket was bad. That was a job changing that. Even though I have... A little bit more modern equipment than I had uh, 30 years ago. Um, still a chore. But anyway, uh, the board is, is about as clean as it's going to get. I've cleaned all the solder traces uh, best I could. The board is a thousand times cleaner than it was. So now I'm just going to sit down and try to figure out what components I need to put this thing back together. And um, a char. Uh, i got to put these resistors back. All these capacitors, I gotta clean this transistor up, see if I, how well it is, how well it cleans up. Uh, put these resistors back on the board, change these capacitors out, and uh, put the board back in the chassis, uh, put the power transformer back in the chassis and the uh, audio output once I figure out how to clean the leads on that, whatever that is growing on them. Uh, then I got to do something electrolytic caps. I hadn't decided what yet, but once I get all that done and change these two tubes, which is a um, see that's 12x7 that goes here, and the uh, 6aq5 right here. But change the capacitors on here, put the tubes in it, uh, um, put the transformer back in after I clean it up, and I may or may not paint that. I don't know yet. And then this transformer here is the audio output transformer, so I'll. Uh, I'm going to clean the wiring on it, get all this stuff back together, and give it a little power and see what happens. It may work. It may go up in the biggest cloud of smoke this side of the Mississippi River. Anyway, that's all for now. Talk to y'all later. Hey, guys. I'm finishing up on this T1200 DC remote. Uh, it's fully functional now. I've 
it's been about an hour and a half on this video already. Uh, basically, I had to go in through the whole thing and just pull the pull the audio compression board out completely, dismantle it, clean all the crap off of it, the mice and all that other excrement and pee and all that other stuff. Got that uh, put back together, replaced uh, a bunch of capacitors on it. Both the six AQ five and the twelve AX seven tube was bad. I had to replace it too. Uh, the other thing. Uh, had to replace uh, both filter caps and I went ahead and restuffed those two capacitors. Uh, let's see, cleaned up the uh, chassis some. I didn't get it completely de-rusted but for what this is uh, and what it started out like I think it's worlds better. Uh, I didn't do my Cadillac job that probably could have and should have but I wanted this thing for a specific purpose and make it look presentable and I think I've accomplished that. It's completely functional. Let me turn this noisy heater off. It's completely and 100% functional. The compressor works on it. The compressor by the way has 30 dB of compression. I went ahead and set it for, uh, for minus 20 so it's going to do a great job of uh, maintaining audio. Uh, put it back in the case. I cleaned the case uh, the front cleaned up rather good. Uh, I had to repaint the metal shell around it and I had to sand it down and put a coat of primer on it. Put two coats of the only paint I had. It's not the exact color, but it'll do the job. Uh, anyway, I got it back together and I'm going to turn the camera around and let you see it. And then I'm going to explain to you what all this other extras is. So give me a second. Okay, I've rotated the uh, viewfinder. Now this is the unit right here. That is the Motorola T1200. Uh, I will say the uh, speaker grill was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. Uh, this had some silver paint on it, and like some they had painted something on, laid it on top of it, and painted something. You still see a few flecks if you look really close. Uh, the volume control knob, uh, the Motorola symbol. These are all detachable uh, uh, plates which um, you can add switches and stuff like that depending on what kind of functions you want. Up here is a uh, blank plate but you can have a VU meter here and a clock here and like I said different switches here. And If you look closely right here there was a gold kind of a dark gold looking chevron piece of plastic chevron it went here however this did not have it and I can't find one so it does not have a chevron on it uh... the case i don't know if i had a picture of it but case if you look really close probably hard to see but it's still got some little roughness here you might be able to see it where it was just super rusted but um, the case turned out good i elected not to do nothing i just took this and cleaned it really good i don't know if you can see it with this glare or not it still has some blemishes but it's not nasty it's perfectly clean and I like this look because it's used it's well used it's a warrior I mean this thing was made in this run was this this particular model was 1966 for an average run of this thing this is back when Adam West was Batman y'all and Captain Kirk you know and all that was around uh, so this thing does a good job and let me uh, set the camera right here. I'm going to turn you around slightly. See if we can see some of the innards of here. This is the back of the unit. This is what the original color was. This is the nameplate right here. This is the uh, this is what color this should have been. But I had nothing like this, and honestly, I cheaped out on it. It was uh, I just it was time to finish this project uh, you know yeah I could go in and I could get really I could get really um, gone ho about this and I, one day I'll, I'll find the right color but it's not that important to me it looks a thousand times better than what it did that's how you get to the access to it and uh, this is what it looks like in the back now this filter capacitor right here is one of them. these two are the ones I stuffed and basically I cut them with a Dremel 
cut them I took them out first which was not easy to do uh, but anyway I cut them right about there on both of them and pull them apart gutted them and then stuffed some uh, uh, radio lead uh, electrolytics in here and this one apparently I didn't notice that when I put it in and soldered it in place that I got it crooked and uh, it's just not worth it to take it back out it's not I didn't make this for a museum I actually have a function for this if you can see this is the uh, let me get you a little more light let me get a little more light sorry about that that is the audio compression board it turned out really nice I had to change about 99 percent of the uh, capacitors in it it's just a few survivors and also right here that little transistor is just a I think it's a 2N22 or 2306 I think if I can't remember it's just a plain old PNP transistor uh, just picked one out of my drawer and it worked fine however that isn't the transmit circuit that's in the uh, it, which I'll never use this thing will never transmit uh, it's basically for receive only if you look back here in the back these two diodes here those two diodes there I replaced those yes I left them high uh, you know you can say I shoddy workmanship or whatever but if you're in the service uh, business that's usually what happens when you're in the field and you change those diodes now yes I could make this a lot prettier but personally I think it looks great I love this thing it's it works uh, also I'm not uh, I don't have a problem with it I had to change those two diodes because that's part of the compression circuit uh, there's another capacitor in there that little orange one right there I had to change it because it was one that was a little white one like this right here it was completely shorted the compression circuit didn't even work and when I tried running tones through it it just went into oscillation just running away with itself so I had to change that um, there are all the resistors check good on that board. All these Allen Bradleys were good. I didn't find hardly anything at all wrong. Uh, so the compression board turned out really good. Um, I had to change both the AX7 and the 6AQ5. And if you notice real close, they both are Motorola branded. So at least that's a positive. Now again, here is the TR relay right here. There's the line transformer back there. Uh, this is a selenium rectifier pack right here and I did not change those they are working fine I've had this thing in operation now for four days it's no problem at all it's not uh, it's not hardly drawing it's drawing 25 watts so there's no problem with this the power transformer lurking in that back corner uh, so anyway uh, here's where a microphone would plug into it for the uh, base station microphone and this is where the uh, the uh, phone line attached right here. Now these phone lines, you've heard me say this before, these are not ordinary phone lines where you can plug a, a telephone into it and get a dial tone. These are basically a dry pair that um, that's basically solid copper connection from this terminal to this transmitter site and you can't even get those nowadays. So you had not been able to get a DC line in 20 years. But in the old days of the telephone, that's what the standard was. And usually you get about 20 to 30 miles. Uh, but you can't do that anymore. Nowadays, it's, uh, the, uh, they use uh, tone signaling to control, which instead of sending DC current out, it sends a uh, group of tones out that tells the transmitter, hey, I want to key up, or hey, I want channel 2, or hey, I want to monitor, or something of that nature. It uses tones, which means it can go through... You know, it can go from exchange to exchange to exchange and not have to worry about the DC levels. So, anyway, uh, but you can't get DC anymore. So, uh, all this other stuff is various other functions that you can do. Uh, the microphone level, which we won't use that, but if you plug your microphone in, you set this for a certain compression. Uh, line input level, uh, that's coming from the uh, base station, and the line output is sending to the base station. So you adjust your microphone level for compression, your line output level, uh, you can't exceed plus 4 dBm, if I remember right on the phone line, so you tried to set this for 0 or 4 dB, 
uh, I always like to put it at zero dB. Then you line input level, you adjust it for uh, for your signal to just actually I just set it by the manual and I just put in minus 20 in and I set the the um, uh, compression uh, to just start functioning at minus 20 that way as it gets up higher levels it starts backing down that way it keeps your uh, audio levels pretty constant but that's what the back of this thing looks like after I got through repair like I say I just when I got through with these filter caps got them stuffed made sure they were right I just use some of this aluminum uh, duct tape on it and just put it back there. Like I say, I got both of them slightly crooked. It, 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 it's, I didn't even realize it till it was all done. And you know, you know, I'm not taking this thing back apart for that. So anyway, that's what that looks like. Now, turn this light off. Put it back where it belongs. And now, if you'll follow this, these clip leads comes around joins these two guys follow it around and it goes up and around and down and goes into these right here this right here now I'm just using what I had available I didn't go buy nothing um, anyway this hooks into the two wire uh, line section of this is a little remote control chassis that uh, these things talk to. However, that's not quite accurate because this actually is a tone control device. Notice all these ships and all this kind of stuff. This is actually made for tone controls, which um, which it sends out uh, 1950, then 1275, a little burst of 1275, and I think 2100, I think, is the uh, guard tone, which as long as that, that tone is present to transmitter say. I won't use any of that function. Basically, all this is this is a CTEC. This is a Vega 223 series tone remote adapter. I've had this laying into my junk pile. Matter of fact, I had used this case for something else. I just put this in a box for safekeeping, and then I sided whatever I had this what was in this case. I took it out and put this what this uh, remote chassis back in. But anyway, I'm using all that I'm using this for is the interface between this device here, my remote control, and this radio. This is a Motorola MaxTrack radio. And basically it's receive only. I went in and disabled the transmit because at my place of work we have a 100 foot tower behind my building which has a 160 megahertz uh, 4 bay antenna on top uh, and it's uh, used for our Marty's, for our RPU's uh, what we use for remote pickup antennas for remotes for doing ball games and stuff like that which we hardly ever we hardly use the remotes but I mean the uh, Marty's anymore but um, anyway I'm going to use that antenna I'm going to take this radio and, and install it in that rack I'll put it on top of the rack that this thing is uh, that those Marty's and everything are on and I will take the antenna right here and connect it to the multi-coupler system that I have that's basically uh, gives me a divided uh, output you got the antenna on the tower goes down a coax cable goes into the building goes into a amplifier comes out of the amplifier goes into a splitter or multi coupler as it's called in the business and then it goes out to each individual Marty receiver uh, but in this case I'm going to take one of the outputs of the receiver and plug it into the input of this radio and basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to monitor um, train to dispatcher uh, frequencies for one of the railroads here because uh, I can hear the dispatcher to train talk but I can't a lot of times hear what the train is saying to the dispatcher and also because it's a split channel it's, the dispatcher is talking on one frequency and they're having a two-way conversation I can't hear a lot of times because of the scan features of the radio I'm listening to I can't hear what the whole conversation so I'm going to use this receiver to listen to the train to dispatcher and let my other radio do it you know do the dispatcher to train or the road frequency so 
I have, uh, I'm going to run a dedicated line from uh, my equipment room to uh, to my office to where this will be located. I want to just run a little pair of, uh, just a single little plain old phone line and I'm going to run it between here and here. And uh, basically this is nothing more than a little old well, Radio Shack two and a half amp power supply a little max track radio. I'm sorry is this max track? Yeah, a little max track radio here that's receive only. Like I said I've disabled the transmit section on here because I don't want this thing keying up for whatever reason and blowing up my other stuff equipment that I have in that room. So it's a receive only basically. Uh, I've already programmed it. It takes uh, rate special software to program these things. I've already programmed it for the frequencies that I'm going to listen to. Uh, the output comes out of a 16 pin option plug right here. I've got voltage. I see this is ground. Uh, the orange is uh, 12 volts and then this blue wire is the audio that comes from this radio and it comes into the uh, to the receive in and then this thing processes it so I've already run a through my signal generator right here I've attached a tone a signal to this at 60 percent deviation uh, and then set the output of this to 0 dB so now these, this right here and this right here jive perfectly and uh, I want to demonstrate this to you if you'll give me just well I'm going to have to I'm going to have to generate a signal if you'll give me just a minute okay I had to pause you a minute all right, so what I've done is I've got the radio on this main frequency channel, that, or this main channel that I want it to monitor on. I've put two frequencies in here, and I can select them if I need to, but that's just a dedicated frequency receiver on a high antenna. So anyway, i got the signal generator hooked to the radio, coupled to the antenna input, RF output. So I'm going to generate a tone, or activate the signal, half a microvolt. At 400 hertz uh, tone at 3 kilohertz deviation. And that is the remote picking it up. I can change channels. And you can hear the radio beeping and all that stuff. And that's really all this whole thing does. I've just got a radio attached to an interface device it's a line, it sends out 0 dB uh, line level this thing sits here and picks it up very clean audio and that's all this is really for that's what the whole thing's all about I just use pieces and parts to you know, fix this thing other than the capacitors that I had to order from Mouser but it's good to go and I haven't worked on these things since probably the early 80s I've uh, worked on a few of them I didn't get that many in the shop but I remember I changing the capacitor in this thing or something in, the, in one of these things and I thought at the time boy is that pain in a pot but anyway it works it's I'm proud of it I'm ready to I just got to get up in my attic at the office and run my cable to my equipment room to uh, to my office. I gotta figure out where to put this bad boy. But that's it. I'm done with this thing. I appreciate you guys following along. I hope it was fairly interesting. Uh, I had a blast working on this because stuff I used to do for a living uh, years ago. But anyway, thanks for riding along with me and uh, hopefully I'll have something else interesting coming up. You guys have a great one and I will talk to y'all in the next one. Bye.